Good morning. Welcome to worship. It's always a joy to be together and to welcome you here in this place. A particular welcome to those of you who are visiting or here for the first time. We're glad to have you with us. And if you want more information about the community, there are little cards, I hope, in your pew backs and around the chairs that you might be sitting in to have you fill out to join our mailing list or uh, to ask for a prayer or to drop a note. You can fill those out and drop half of it in the offering plate, and it'll make its way to me and to the office. We have a couple announcements to share as we gather this morning. Um, We have a new members gathering, the first of a series of three or four classes. So Beth Nordbeck and I will meet in the last classroom on this level at the end of the hall following worship. Um, And so if you're interested in more information about the church, even if you're a seasoned member, we always say it's great to, uh, if you want to stop in, Beth and I will talk a bit about the history of uh, the United Church of Christ and the history of uh, the church in America, and it's a very informative time, and you're welcome to explore uh, membership together. And so today's the first of those gatherings, so we welcome you to that. We have a special offering today. This is one of um, the five special offerings of the United Church of Christ, and so there's a handout in your bulletin. It's Neighbors in Need Week. Um, you know, this offering happens at this time of the year, and it often falls right in the middle of some enormous disaster, like hurricanes. So I have been thinking very much of how far these dollars go um, as I watch the devastation in Florida and the devastation uh, that has come up the East Coast in these last days. And so this is an offering that very much uh, reaches out to um, relief work in our own country. So communities and sister and brother churches uh, that that need our help, that need to be rebuilt. You and I have seen much... um, uh, video feed and and pictures of the disasters that have happened in the last couple days due to to such weather and so there should be envelopes in your midst for special offerings for this week and next week for neighbors in need and so I, I draw your attention to that and next week we will celebrate our covenant with Penwe Ghana uh, which is a village in Ghana that we have been in covenantal relationship with for some years since 2008 we have a handful of folks in our midst who have gone to Ghana and, and served in that community and gotten to know our folks there and have supported young women there um, with scholarships. And so we're going to celebrate that. You're going to hear some of their stories and reflections. Uh, you'll see beautiful fabrics um, throughout our time together and some lively and upbeat music. So uh, we look forward to celebrating our relationship with Ghana and, and putting more attention and focus into that Uh, covenantal ministry next Sunday. And then I have two announcements. Carol wants to say a word about the outreach lunch, and Phyllis wants to say a word about, or Tom's going to say the word about dinner. So, come on up. You have to speak right into this microphone. Hi. Um, I will be in the back of the church. You have to speak right? They're not going to hear you. Hold on. I'll be in the back of the church, um, directly back there, uh, after the service. Um, I'm a member of the Faith in Action Committee, and once a year our church is asked by All Saints Church to host an outreach luncheon uh, for shut-ins, um, nursing home residents, and I think for some um, special uh, needs people that are in institutions. And they come with their caregivers, and we serve a total with with the helpers of 60 people. It will be uh, this year on Thursday, October 27th at noon. We're asking for uh, people to work in the kitchen and people to prepare either a chicken casserole, a jello salad, or a uh, gingerbread um, dessert. And I will have sign-ups in the back, and things have to be, we'll give you the recipes, and everything has to be delivered by 11 o'clock to the All Saints Kitchen on Thursday, October 27th. I'll see you in the back after church. Thank you. Thanks. I hope you can hand it to Tom. Good morning. I'd like to remind you that uh, this Saturday, October 15th, the Family Care Board will be sponsoring the uh, Italian dinner. It will start at uh, 6 p.m., This is a a wonderful opportunity to gather for some fellowship and a delicious meal. Pastor Gina will be providing her famous bolognese sauce, 
may be enhanced after she spends several months on her sabbatical in Italy. We're looking forward to that. And Chef Mark Hebert will be providing marinara sauce. Uh, it'll be a great, a great meal. Uh, you can also bring your own wine or beer to uh, complement this uh, delicious meal. Uh, it's clearly optional. Beverages will be provided. Uh, Church Council has approved this event, so you can bring wine or beer, and it's consistent with our uh, alcohol use policy here at uh, here at church. Uh, tickets are available uh, back in the gathering space after worship service, and you can contact the uh, church office. Either Krista or Bethany can provide tickets for you as well. We hope we sell out tickets before the event, but... Uh, if not, uh, please please come and and uh, and hopefully there will be tickets uh, at, that can be sold at the door. If your schedule does not allow you to uh, attend this dinner, uh, you can uh, make a donation, purchase the tickets, and we'll see that someone else uh, could benefit from those. And there are uh, sign up sheets both for workers. The Family Care Board needs your support. We need some dishwashers. Um, someone to help Steve Curtis wash dishes, and we need a few more servers and some kitchen help. Um, is that a surprise, Steve? Your name's on the list. <laughs> okay. I won't tell you who put it on there. I did not do that. <laughs> um, so please, if, if you can, uh, sign up. Look forward to seeing you on, on Saturday. Anything else? Then let us be together in a spirit of worship as we begin with our prelude.
Please join me in the call to worship. Let go of the things that hold you back. May we be open to the movement of God's Spirit. Trust in God's love for you. God's love sets us free. Be ready, for God is doing something new in us. Be prepared, for God has continued to surprise us. Know Jesus and know the way of Christ. For God brings life out of death and turns the world upside down. Come, join your hearts in worship. Come, let us lift our open hearts in praise to God. together in the unison prayer of invocation and the Lord's Prayer. We stand, we stand in, in awe of you, you most gracious God. God. You love your people, no matter the circumstance. 
You want us to live meaningful lives with you at the center. So we say to you, loving God, come. Send your Holy Spirit to dwell with us in worship. Open our hearts and receive our minds to be challenged by the teachings of Jesus the Christ as we pray the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So I invite you to be seated, but somehow the chancel steps got left out of the bulletin. So, do we have kiddos with us? Or have they already gone off to church school? No, here they are. I see some. Come on up. Excellent. Lovely. Good morning. (laughs) Yawn, yawn. Good morning. Good morning. So, does anybody know what a deacon is? No. Does anybody know what a deacon is? Uh, Do you know who the people are that serve communion at church? Who are the people that serve communion? You forget! Does anybody know? Who serves communion? I'll give you a hint. It's related to the first question I just asked you. Who did I just ask you about? The deacons. Okay, so who serves communion? The deacons. Excellent. (laughs) The deacons in our church are responsible for the spiritual welfare of the congregation. It's kind of a big charge, the spiritual welfare. Do you have any idea what the spiritual welfare of the congregation might be? No. So one way that some churches understand Um, So spiritual welfare is a big thing. It means, um, do you know what spiritual means? It has to do with the spirit, right, exactly. So it has to do with the holy, has to do with God. So our spiritual welfare or our spiritual well-being has to do with um, the care that we take of our spirit, the ways that God is present in our community and in our church, and in this space. What do we call this place that we're... Church, but what's this room in particular called? The sanctuary. So the deacons, in general, one of the things that the deacons do, they're responsible for everything that takes place in this sanctuary. So they're not the only ones responsible, but they kind of get to oversee and make decisions um, and think about those things in our congregation that are particularly related to our spirit and that take place in this sanctuary. So... We try to share that work. We're always, we are always have new deacons that come along, but because they have a special role in our church, we like to install them with special prayers and special intentions. So we have one new deacon um, this year that we elected at our annual meeting in June, and we're going to say some prayers over him. And I thought maybe you could help me. What do you think? Since you're part of the spiritual community in our church. So I want to invite David to come on up, and I want to invite the other deacons to come on up with David. Do you know David? Okay, so first we're going to introduce you to David. (laughs) So this is our newest deacon. This is David Holden, and these are some of our children. This is Kaylin and Lexi and Curtis and Nate, Um, and so they represent all of the other children in our congregation. You've seen some of them around. And these are the other deacons at the moment. But we also like to say around here, once a deacon, always a deacon. So there are a whole bunch of other people sitting out there and who belong to our church who have also been deacons. And when these deacons need some help doing their work, they sometimes call on people who have been deacons in the past to say, help, we need more hands. So, um, But we we like to say special prayers over our deacons, and we're going to do something called a laying on of hands. Have you ever watched us do a laying on of hands? You have. You just don't remember. I know you do. So we believe that when uh, one of the things that we do when we 
pray over someone into a special position is that we pass the Spirit of God. So we believe in our tradition that the Spirit of God, where's the Spirit of God? There's almost not a wrong answer to this question. Do you have any? Take a guess. Everywhere! <laughs> right, so the Spirit of God is everywhere, which also means the Spirit of God is inside each of us. So what we do when we do a laying on of hands is that we kind of think about the Spirit of God that's in each one of us, and we ask and we try to share it with someone else, and we believe that we pass that on when we, when we put our hands on one another, that together the Spirit moves through us. And so a little bit of the Spirit in me, and a little bit of the Spirit in you, and a little bit of the Spirit in you, it all comes together to be a lot of Spirit, right? So we're going to lay hands on David to... Uh, fill him up with the Spirit of God so that he goes and is a faithful deacon to take care of us and to take care of the church on behalf of the whole world. It's a lot, right? That means we need to give him a lot of spirit, okay? So we're going to have David stand in the middle, and the deacons can come around him, and they're going to put hands on him. And then everybody else, if you would also, we need a lot of spirit. So you can make a little chain. You can put, you can stand up. You can put... Uh, hands on one another's shoulders, and we'll, and yeah, it, excellent. So the idea is that everybody is touching someone else. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the laying on of hands is a symbolic act whereby the church in every age recognizes God's call to ministry in the lives of faithful women and men and asks the Holy Spirit to confer upon them the gifts of ministry. We lay hands upon you, David, for the position of deacon. May the Holy Spirit strengthen you for the ministry of deacon in Christ's church and equip you with every good thing to do God's will. Receive authority to execute this office of deacon in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. So you can all go back to your seats. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good work. And I think you're heading off to church school. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus. So we're in chapter 32, and it's verses 1 to 14. So this is a familiar story. This is the story of um, the people of Israel building and making the golden calf and worshiping the golden calf. So we are told shortly before this that we're in that time in the book of Exodus when Moses is going up and down the mountain to meet with God. Moses has gone and received the Ten Commandments from God and brought them back. The people have recently come out of Egypt, out of slavery. Um, in these past weeks, we've been making our way to that moment in the story. And Moses has discovered that when Moses is at the top of the mountain and in the presence of God, it's good. Moses really likes being on the top of the mountain in the presence of God. And so sometimes Moses is up there for a really long time. So this is uh, the moment we find ourselves in this story, that Moses has been up the mountain, we're told in the scriptures, for 40 days. We don't really know if it's actually been 40 days. 40 days in the Hebrew Bible is often a stand-in for a really long time um, because it's that that turn of phrase that we hear often. It takes 40 days for the people to move through the desert. It takes 40 days um, for Jesus later in the New Testament. And so when you hear that phrase, 40 days, you might as well read a really long time. And while they're, they're without Moses, the people feel very much without God because they see the presence of Moses as the assurance that God is present among them. And so they, they get up to some trouble. So from the 32nd chapter of the book of Exodus, verses 1 to 14. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, 
people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us. Who shall go before us? As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on your ears, on the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them and formed it into a mold and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once, your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so my wrath might burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent he brought them out to kill in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath. Change your mind. Do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel, your servants. You swore to them by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land I have promised will give to your descendants, and they will inherit it forever. And so the Lord changed his mind about the disaster he planned to bring on his people. Here ends our reading this morning. God indeed add a blessing to the reading of these words. To join me in the spirit of prayer. Gracious and holy God, we are an anxious people. When we do not know what lies ahead this night or tomorrow or the next week, we are prone to be fearful in the wake of the unknown. And so come among us this morning and quell our fears, quiet our anxieties, that the meditations of my heart and the words on my lips might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, my Savior and Some years ago, I uh, served on a church and ministry committee. The church and ministry committee is a committee that uh, is made up of area churches in a county or an association, and each church has a representative, or a couple of churches has a representative to this committee. It's the church and ministry committee that authorizes and supervises people for authorized ministry, and also acts on behalf of the churches. Um, to to do work and ministry together in that place and to authorize and supervise one another for ministry. One of my roles on that committee was to help churches in that area prepare to interview for new pastors um, as they prepared a profile or they prepared to interview candidates. They needed a practice interview. They needed an interview with a candidate who they knew would not be eligible for the position, with whom they could make mistakes, and who then, after the interview was over, would offer some honest feedback so that they could learn um, and interview all the more wisely when the real thing came around. And so I served as a practice interview for a handful of churches in that association. And I had a couple questions that I would always ask, um, a couple You know, there were some easy questions, and they would have easy questions for me. And then I tried to come up with a couple zingers that would really, you know, wake them up, better to prepare the committee um, ahead of time than in the midst. 
So I would ask questions. I would ask what I call my million dollar question. I would ask, so if 10 years from now, um, you look back and you look back on the pastor that you have called and you look around at the state of the church and the congregation and the community and you say, we have made a good choice. We have made a good choice. We called and heard the spirit well. How do you know? What does that look like? How, um, what does success look like in that congregation and community? What in your wildest dreams have gone well or correctly to tell you um, that you have made a good choice? That was a lovely question, and people would often uh, dream and talk about what that would look like. And then I would ask what I called the sacred cow question. So I would say to the community, so if I came to your church and uh, you called me as your pastor and I accepted the call, um, what's the fastest way I could get in trouble around here? That is to say, what is the thing that I would do that would anger the most number of people most quickly? Well, the committee would always, oh my God, why is she asking this question? And in fact, I have used both of these questions in my own interviewing and pursuing of, uh, of call in different communities. It's fascinating to watch a committee wrestle. How honest will we be? How much will we really tell her? It's kind of like asking the candidate, right, what are your weaknesses, right? But it always tells me something about a community. I remember one little church outside of Worcester told me, um, well, they said, after they had told me that their goals amongst them was to be more open and to grow as a church, to invite a wider community, they then told me, well, if you stop saying service in German, many people would be very upset. And I said, well, you know I don't speak German. They were an immigrant church from several generations ago, and at one time they had been filled with a German population that didn't speak any English, but all of those people had long gone. But don't cancel the service in German. There was one church that told me if I rearranged the objects in the kitchen, um, the woman who ran the kitchen would, would start a coup to throw me out as their pastor. That told me something about the fixedness of their church, um, that things had to be in the right place and the change would be difficult, let alone the rearranging of the flatware. But in truth, every congregation, every one of us has a sacred cow. A sacred cow. Some sacred cows need to be toppled. In this passage, it is not that the people are foolish enough to think that the golden calf that they make is indeed God. We hear them say, in fact, this is, um, this is the God who has brought you up out of Egypt. But so they must believe it to be an image that represents God and that will attract God's presence or a pedestal on which God will stand invisibly. This image did not represent a different God. We don't hear them ever call the holy by a different name. In fact, we hear them call the calf Yahweh, um, that who brought us out, out of slavery. They are only guilty of building an idol. But Aaron chooses an image that's familiar to the people, that represents other gods. For the Canaanites at the time, a calf or a bull represented the god of Baal. We know the God of Baal um, later in the book, in the stories of Elijah, in the book of First and Second Kings, there's that great um, contest about whose God will make it rain. I will call on the Lord God and you will call on Baal. Of course, the Lord God wins. But Aaron also chooses this image because the image of a bull in that time, in the time of Egypt, was the image that represented the God Apis. And so... We're sure that at once he was intending for it to be the Lord God, Yahweh, and yet it also has this complexity of representing other gods. The people seem to believe if Moses is with them, then God is with them, and if Moses is not with them, then God must not be with them. Walter Brueggemann writes, This golden calf is an alternative representation of the same God, not idolatrous, but simply a competitor to the Ark of the Covenant as the proper sign of divine presence. Aaron responds to this people with religious solutions. They are anxious and they are fearful, and he gives them a cult object. He builds an altar and holds a festival. 
On the surface, it doesn't look all that terrible. We might simply be seeing a different tradition or interpretation about how to worship, how to be faithful. Brueggemann writes, those who benefit too well from holy things, who lose critical self-awareness, and who begin to think they are the producers of the holy. It becomes a competition, a conflict between rival priestly groups with competing interpretive values. And it's a little bit dangerous. God gets angry. God's anger, God is famous for being angry in the Hebrew Bible. How many people, when I tell them, oh, I love the Old Testament, I love the prophets of the Hebrew Bible, the common response is that the God of the Old Testament is an angry God. We must not simply relegate the God of the Old Testament to being angry. God is indeed angry in this passage, but there's a specific reason, and there's a specific provocation that makes God angry. And the people are anxious. They are anxious that they do not have a leader, and they are fearful about not having a leader and not knowing where he's gone. God is emotional in the Old Testament. We think of Jesus as the emotional center in the Gospels and in the New Testament, but God is emotional in the Old Testament. He gets angry and he gets disappointed, and so do we. And God is also positive. He loves and he forgives in the Old Testament, just as we do. It is a way for us to think about how God is like us, how we are like God. But the people feel unheard. Justice has been delayed in the coming. We know a little something about justice being delayed in the coming. We who live in a fearful and anxious time in a fearful and anxious country, what can we do in that anxiety? There's this temptation to fix it, to find an easy solution. The easy solution of the golden calf is never anything but a temporary fix. We have hard and long work to do to repair and restore the true work of God's justice. And so this story becomes for us instructive and cautionary. Instructive in that just as God gets angry, you watch God change God's mind. God allows Moses to participate in the negotiation. It makes God relational for us. God becomes one who listens to humans. God becomes one who is with us and for us. That's not new in the Gospels. That's a very early and consistent image of the God of our Holy Scriptures. In fact, I might say if we relegate God to being this fixed monolithic thing, a settled formula that is only this and never that, then the notion of God in dialogue seems a little weak or inadequate. But if we take the covenantal tradition that is present in the Hebrew Bible seriously, then the lust for absolution eventually becomes idolatrous, flat, a settled God without any dialogic agency, who does not care or answer or engage or respond, is indeed not enough for us, is not enough for one another. Instead, God becomes something that is set apart and separate and different, and our current world uh, moves on, and it's easy for us to relegate God to something that is radically different instead of radically trusting. Moses has this radical trust in God, has this audacious faith that he feels his relationship with God is so steadfast that he can challenge God. He can ask and encourage God to change God's mind. And in fact, that's the pattern we see in this exchange, that there is a covenant between God and God's people, and what happens? The people break the covenant. And the covenant is remade again and again. It is, in fact, examples of divine grace. God's final word is never a word of judgment. It is God remaking the covenant with God's people again and again. It only permits and requires questioning. It is a chance for us to continually participate and to um, be in dialogue with the holy. 
In our current day, we still have a tendency to shape the gods that we can manage or manipulate, from which we seem to receive this strange sort of comfort. It represents maybe something we long for or long to be, whether that's um, in a predictable time or always knowing where the flatware in the kitchen is, or wanting to worship in the same language and ways that our ancestors from long ago did. We might think we are fashioning a better representation of God, perhaps even one that is in our own image and likeness. We see in this story and in our own life the human longing to worship, to put our trust in something mysterious and greater than ourselves. Some of us call this a human quest for spirituality. And the story reminds us that not all objects of our spiritual longing are equal. We have many contemporary false gods. We could name them. Today they look like technology, or fame, or power, or success, or prestige, money. We may succumb to this foolish faith that a military power and its symbols might save us. Gerald Jansen writes, the people of Israel seem to have absorbed this sorry lesson from their former oppressor, Egypt. They resort to the very wisdom under which they've been so oppressed, the wisdom based in fear and expressed in overwhelming, controlling, and coercive force. What makes us feel secure today? In what do we put our trust? I want to leave you with a question that haunts me that I read uh, in a quote by the author David Foster Wallace. Because here's something else that's weird but true, Wallace writes. In the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as, as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And so, if I were to ask you, the people of First Congregational Church of Wolfboro, as your pastor and leader, what's the fastest way I could get in trouble around here? Think in your own life. If you were to invite a newcomer or a visitor into your home, what's the fastest way that he or she could get in trouble? in your family or your circle of being. And maybe then consider Wallace's reflection. Everybody worships. It's simply a question of what we worship. Some sacred cows need toppling. May it be so. Our hymn of prayer is in our Red Pilgrim hymnal, Faith of Our Fathers.
I invite you to be seated. We take a time to share our prayer concerns with one another, to share our joys and to share our burdens. I invite you to open our prayers each week with our prayers for peace in the world, for places that know too well the sting and the pain of war, the cost of violence and unease. We particularly pray as we make our way through the books of Genesis and Exodus and the Old Testament for the Middle East, for Israel and Palestine that have for too long known war. We would ask your prayers for the people of Syria, particularly for those who are caught in the crossfire of uh, disaster and of danger for children and for civilians. And I would ask your prayers for our own country in a chapter when we seem to be caught very much in anxious times of fear and unknown. Our prayers that peace indeed may visit lands that have never known it. We pray for those who have um, signed up for lives of service, who have donned uniforms of military and of human aid, who have um, given lives to human relief and uh, doctors without borders and peacemakers and keepers. We pray for those who have been devastated and affected by Hurricane Matthew, particularly for the people of Haiti and the people in Florida and on the East Coast. I would ask your prayers for the Moore family. Kara Moore um, almost went on hospice hospice care this uh, last couple of days. She, uh, hospice evaluated her and decided she was not close enough to dying. And so they've instead put her on palliative care. The family is in some upheaval over uh, the decision and the days. And they've also recently sold the family home. They closed on that on Friday. Um, A a landmark in town, really, that home on the corner of North Main Street and and Wombach. So our prayers for that family, a very um, family, a a pillar family in this congregation and community. I would ask your prayers for Pat Moffitt, who's headed in for a knee replacement surgery this week, um, for for safe and wise surgery and good and um, and safe uh, recovering. And for Blair's safe return, Blair has been uh, at a Credo uh, conference leading and teaching, and he flies home tomorrow in time to take Pat in for surgery on Tuesday. So so our prayers for the Moffats. Um, And our prayers in this election season, where um, hate and fear and anxiety and nastiness seem to be all the louder each day. And so our prayers for safe elections Um, and for good and, and, and righteous peace in a land. Steadfast and holy God, you are a gracious God. You are a God who has made us in your image, and we seek not to make you in our image. We give thanks for the ways that we feel disappointed and angry, that we are able to turn that into love and forgiveness and mercy, that you model for us in the scriptures as you model for us in the life of Jesus, what love looks like, honest and true and bold, what compassion looks like when we reach out to help and heal one another, when we take the long work of justice seriously, and not simply give in to anxious times and fearful moments. Keep our feet on the path of loving and hoping. Keep our minds open and our hearts tender, that we might be broken open by the wounds and the scars of one another, that we might be buoyed by the achievements and the successes when love wins, when hope rises, when we become a stronger, more faithful people together. We pray in the name of Jesus, who first offered us your love made real in flesh and blood and hands and feet in this world, forever and always. Amen.
We are invited each week that we worship together to be more together than we can be apart, to collect up our prayers and our intentions um, and our treasure to be the people of God in this place. May our morning offering be received. prayer of dedication. Accept these gifts as evidence of our desire to participate with you in the care of your beloved. These gifts symbolize our thanksgiving for all that you provide. Through these gifts, we praise you, O God. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 381 in your pilgrim hymnal. By faith, it is an oaken staff.
As you go out into this day and those that will come this week, may you know indeed the peace and the abiding steadfastness of the holy, the spirit that imbues and surrounds all that we are and all that we do to love and serve in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.